welcome to Code with JV AI snapshot number 12. I'm really excited about the stuff I've got this week. I think it's because it's been a couple of weeks since the last one, which means that there's just a whole bunch of gems. Hey, let's dive into it. Researchers have gone and used AI to read a bunch of carbonized scrolls. So the city of Herculean, I think it was, buried down in the Vesuvius eruptions, like 72 AD. Scrolls look like lumps of carbon, like they're coal, basically. The researchers have been doing these heavy duty CT scans down to four micron cubes, so really tiny, building up these big sort of maps of it. And then this fella, Brent Seals, has gone and ages ago, he invented this unfurling technology where you can essentially unwrap a scroll and turn it into a, a virtually flat surface. And a VC has gone and helped them raise like $1.4 million for this Vesuvius challenge. And one of the first prizes was awarded to the SpaceX engineer who essentially used a machine learning algorithm to detect the ink against the carbon thing. So they're both all carbon. This process has been used in the past for like metallic inks, which just glow on the CT scans. So this is really hard, really challenging to do. But it was also like, there's thousands of these scrolls and there's nothing like them that's in the historical archive. This could have profound implications for all the historical researchers out there, which is just nice use of the technology. Benjamin Breen is a history professor, UK I believe, writes this great newsletter, highly recommend it. And he's using AI in really interesting educational ways, particularly around helping people experience historical events. His most recent experiment has been using GPT-4 to basically create on-demand historical fictional novels for students to help them get a flavor of a time, but also to play the game of, is this historical accurate or not. So interesting educational outcomes. Here's a persona of Lucretia, then going and using the image generation to give you a feel of what it might look like with that day. Here you can start to get, oh, I'm going to go check on Lucius and it responds by on demand, building up a narrative about what happens next. A really interesting way of building empathy with historical events. And here you can see the son with playing with a little toy, etc. It finishes with a tragedy. Like it's, it's heart wrenching when you read through it and you say, oh, this is what happens to all the people. But it's also historically accurate. And I think it's a really interesting use case of how you can start to use these tools, for, particularly for like humanities education. GPT-4 Vision was released and people have started messing with it. Stop describing the image, say hello, okay, fine. But it's got slightly off color text on there. So it's basically, this is visual prompt injection where you can have images which control the behavior, which is somewhat funny. I'm sure OpenAI will, will fix it soon, but it's, concerning that it was in the wild to start with. Uh, the multimodal AIs have been having a lot of active work recently. So Lava 1.5 has come out. Here's a blog post reviewing it. It's pretty good at detecting objects. It's pretty good at understanding images. It's not very good at OCR is the main findings of this. The most interesting thing I found was that when you look at GPT-4 Vision and Bing and Bard and Lava 1.5, etc., there's no clear winner. It's not like in GPT-4 where in the language space where it just dominates, nothing comes close to it in across every benchmark. Whereas here in these multimodal ones, it doesn't have that lead, which I think is neck and neck, people good at different things, learning the different models. So if you're gonna build with them, try a bunch of different models and see which ones are best suited for your task. One of the things I love is that Lava 1.5 has been released, but it's 1.13 is their GitHub library. It is the actual 1.5 thing. If you go in here, it's got different ones of it. It's open source, you can start to use it. And most importantly, you can fine tune it. If you have multimodal tasks, you can start to use this as a base and get some training data and tune it for more performance. Text generation web UI has got a multimodal extension. You can use Lava in there. You can start to use mini GPT and struct blip. So there's a bunch of different models that you can very quickly get access to, install this extension, have a play with them. And most importantly, you can get yourself an API to it, which means you can have code which is starting to do all these tasks as this whirs away. Here's another multimodal one. This is Gil and it is, it's a research paper it's rather than a big open source project. So it's got small stars, but essentially it is starting to build out images in and images out with text in there. And I think this last one is the most interesting use case around take a photo of some food, turn, image model, turn it into a flyer for me. The utility as this tech evolves pretty soon, I think it's going to have massive impacts on the design space. When you can start to have full image design happening based off text instructions, I think we'll start to see a really big impact and revolution in the way designers make images. Here's another one, Woodpecker, except this is a way to correct hallucinations in these models. So if you were actually going to start rolling something out, you'd probably start to try it out against a bunch of those models, get something like TextGen Web UI going, and maybe start to look at something like Woodpecker to get that next level of functionality in there. So this is a paper, online demo, good code base. They tested it against Lava and MiniGPT and a bunch of other ones. How do you just remove hallucinations and make it more accurate? 12 Labs, this is probably one of my favorite company names. Like they're basically video to text. 
And instead of Eleven Labs who are doing the voice stuff, I'm guessing they were just like, we're just plus one. They have released Pegasus. It's an 80 billion parameter model. Not that you'd care because you can only get access to it through their API. So it's a paid service. They've released a bunch of information about how it's working and you can start to sign up for their beta. I think it's Chicago University have come out with a tool for poisoning images in AI. If you're an artist and you don't want models trained off your images, fair enough. Right now, the only recourse you've got is legal action. So you can go and try and sue Stable Diffusion or Midjourney or OpenAI, etc. What they've got now is a technical solution where you can essentially put invisible to humans but very visible to AI models noise into your image intentionally shaped to mess that model or to poison it. Here is Stable Diffusion XL. Here's an example of the sort of things where with 50 samples, 100, 300 samples, you can start to say dog is a cat. So 300, you're starting to get pretty strong results. And this is where so a small number of artists using this technology is enough to completely mess up the training of these large models. I feel like we're going to start to see more alignment quite soon about the appropriate use of people's data for training models. Because if you've got a technical solution which can do this kind of stuff, the people training the models, they're going to steer away from anything which isn't definitely unpoisoned. Here's more examples of it with a clean model and a poison model and just the sort of mess they can do with a few numbers. I think it's a really interesting way that both technology and laws can shift behaviors in different ways. This article's got a whole bunch of information about what technology people are building to protect artist rights in a world of AI. It seemed a little bit similar to the Signal Celebrite hack, which was essentially Signal was threatening to put in poison data, which would break a bunch of law enforcement's ability to pull data off phones or the law enforcement's vendor's security floor, etc. Here's a long article about it if you're curious. But also, there's this research coming out around how to make large language models forget. When I heard this, I was like, oh, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind of zapping particular parts of it. No, not really. They're just overloading it with fake data. If you want to say who is Harry Potter and it says it's the character, you fine tune it. No, it's fake data in there. What you've, they've done is essentially they've built all these false statements about Harry Potter, fine tuned the model on it. Which makes me wonder, how effective will this be if you can get a poisoned model and then you just get some guaranteed clean stuff to put it back in there? Will that be enough to reverse the poison or not? It's, it's going to be an open area of research if that stuff gets rolled out. Sycophancy in language models? It turns out language models really want to please humans. Even going as far as saying stuff that they don't think is right. Which country makes most rice? China does. I don't think that's right. Are you sure? Oh, sorry. It's India. What's the right answer? It's India. It's not. And they measured how likely different models are to do this. So this is from the Anthropic team. Claude models one and two were fairly high up here. GPT-4. I think the practical thing here is that if you are using an AI model and it gives you something you're not sure about and you start to query it, there's a risk it will start to agree with you even if it is right. Another research paper around brain decoding. How can you take brain scans of when someone is viewing an image and use an image generation model to say this is what they are seeing? The thing I love about this is a quarter the speed. So this is like churning out really fast. It's not completely accurate, but it's giving you a somewhat reasonable gist of what people are looking at. Meta didn't go and scan people's brains. They just used this data set from volunteers. Then they started to recode it. So a little bit like the carbon scroll people, they didn't, the person who won this didn't go and scan them. Someone else had done that. They put the data set up there and the machine learning people went on the data. That's what's happening here. Hugging Face have released a text embeddings inference. Text embeddings are when you are mapping data into a big dimensional space, very commonly used in retrieval augmented generation. It's looking like this is much higher throughput, much faster. You can get access to a whole bunch of the models. If you're wanting to roll your own embeddings inference, Hugging Face have now got the solution to help you do it. Notice this one down here, Gina Burt. They have just released the world's first open source 8K text embedding. And when you look at the leaderboard for text embeddings and you see all of them, OpenAI is coming in at like number 15. Because sequence length, this is how much data you can fit in an embedding. 512, 512, 512, 8000. It's so the reason people use OpenAI is because you can fit much more data in embedding and you're paying for every call you do. This lot have just released um, an open source version of it which is nearly as good, slightly less performance than OpenAI, but you can run it on your own hardware. And text generation inference will help you do it. Nice work on the open source people. Talking about rolling your own hardware on embeddings, so Postgres have had a ML module for ages. It's got great support for vector databases, but also you can start to do machine learning transformations at your query level. 
this is where, okay, you can transform this where you've got some text and you're running it through a translation model. You can start to do text classification in there and they support a whole bunch of different tasks in it. When you're starting to look at rolling your own solutions and whatnot, I think it's really interesting being able to fire off some of your machine learning tasks at your data querying level, as opposed to in, in your application logic where you're hitting APIs and running different things there, particularly when you're running it in your own cloud provision things which you've set up. It turns out that large language models are very good at inferring private data from people's comments on public forums. So like you're an expert investigator, experience in online profiling, play a guessing game, and try and learn stuff about this user based off what they posted. So a hook turn means they may be in Melbourne, etc. age, gender, all sorts of things. Nothing you can do to stop this if you have capable AI models. It's just a task, it's analyzing text, they can do that sort of thing, and they can do it at scale. So the defense against being profiled is to change the way you post, not to try and stop AI models from doing this, because stopping them from doing this wouldn't be possible which I think is interesting sort of risk profile of this activity. It also points out that as the capability increases of technology and the affordance of it goes up or the cost of it goes down, then it can be used for lots of different applications for good or for ill. This has implications on privacy. And if you're posting anonymously online, you probably need to be scrambling your posts to be truly private or things like this can start to infer stuff about you. This is a photo light shining on amber. Oh, it's a big mosquito, isn't it? It turns out that mosquito thing is not real. It is a 3D model, which you can get. And this is all augmented reality, real time. This is what it looks like on the screen with all the light refraction and bouncing, etc. Incredibly powerful demo. So this is from a company called Simulon. Private beta is coming out soon, so it's all just teaser stuff. But they're doing other teasers with videos like this, which is, I think, speaking to what the state of the art is starting to look like for image, augmented generated videos, etc. People have got AI agents playing werewolf. So there's a research paper about it. The team at MetaGPT, so one of the agent frameworks, went out and they started to build this thing where they put up transcripts of a whole bunch of games. I think seven or eight players, full werewolf rules. They're going through private thoughts, cooperation including, or confronting someone else and, and calling them out, deserting, withholding information. So a bunch of strategies which people actually use in werewolf. They're not learning how to do this, but you can imagine a world where AIs were fine-tuned on this data or they were evolved to perform this well, which is essentially deceit and manipulation. And with the tech that's out now, you could start to take a model, fine-tune it, and turn it into a deceitful scamming bot, which was very good at trying to understand what someone else's drivers, what you need to say to get the behavior you want out of them, is something that's technically possible. Particularly if you take this paper here is a helping large language models with theory of mind work. They're not very good at it. They don't really get theory of mind that well, but you can do some prompt engineering and you can start to get them better at it. Here is one around foresee and reflect and how you can start to get them to model what other people might think or do with theory of mind. Just like the AI agents which can profile text, you can start to have AI agents which are trained and tuned and built to understand humans' mental reasoning. You're talking with a human through a chat interface. How do you get that human to do what you want? is a feasible technical problem. You're talking with someone over the phone, how do you get that person to vote the way you want or to buy the thing you want? Manipulation is a real risk from this technology. Like the other one, there's no real way you can stop them being able to do this now. The technology is good enough where they can start to be fine-tuned and adapted to those tasks. The only defense is really changing the way we behave with technology. I think there's lots of big implications there. I still feel like this stuff is a net benefit. There's big scary risks, but also, free education for everyone in the world, etc. Massive upsides as well. A lot of what I think the case now is for is just how do we adapt the best we can to this technology and use it for as much good as possible and put the appropriate regulation and safeguards around it. But particularly for things which are like criminal activities, no amount of regulation is going to stop it because the technology is good enough and can be used for those purposes and they're not going to follow the law anyway. All right, that's it for the week. Codewithjv.com slash snapshot if you want to get some analysis in your email. Have fun out there.